This show is for the sales leader who knows they have a pivotal role in driving outstanding sales results. Getting hired or promoted to manage a sales team is a big accomplishment, but you know you have to work hard to become a great sales leader. You are listening to the Divine Comedy of Sales podcast. Here's your host, coach, and advisor to elite sales leaders from around the world, Matt McDarvey. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for joining us for this interview episode. My next guest has had quite an interesting journey from mining engineer to account manager to sales and marketing manager to global sales leader, VP, general manager. He's literally grown up in the mining technology business and picking up lessons about selling, about business development, partnering, about leadership that I know you will find valuable. So welcome my friend, longtime colleague, Greg Lance. Thank you, Matt. Really a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So Greg, as I said at the top, I think the people will, uh, they'll pick up a few gems from our conversation today about uh, selling and leadership. I realize that your career spans not only leading sales teams and a bunch of different functions, you've been a general manager. So uh, I'm going to ask you questions sort of broadly about leadership, but we're going to go deep as deeply as we can into what does it really mean to lead people who are in a selling role? So if you're ready, I'm just going to dive right in and ask you some questions and see what we can pick up from your experiences. Okay. Sounds great, Matt. So right from the top, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned so far about leading a sales organization? or business development function? I think I'll uh, probably connect this back to your your first book, Matt, which uh, is uh, the word cadence, right? So, you know, really taking the time to, re- to meet regularly, to review kind of what's working, what's not working, and get into this coaching rhythm rather than what most sales leaders do where you just kind of wait for a crisis to happen you kind of parachute in and you this sort of firefighting mode you know uh, type of approach I, I think that regular recurring cadence again is uh, is is really the root of coaching and is really the root of what gets people to think differently uh, to behave differently and I think that's probably the I, I wouldn't say that it's only applicable to leading salespeople. That really applies to any leadership role. And it's really about taking the time to sit down and listen and learn. And it's not really about solving a specific problem at a specific time. It's more about kind of training new behaviors. Okay. okay. And uh, thanks for the plug, by the way, right out, right off the top. I knew you'd <laughs> like that. You used the word cadence. I think we've also used the word rhythm, sort of interchangeably operating rhythm cadence. Why, why, and I, your answer was clear, but just tell me more, like, why do you think it's important to have what you described was it's more than just sort of solving a specific problem or just punching into an issue every once in a while, but it's more like creating a rhythm, a kind of a regular flow. Like, tell me more about that. Why do you think that that's, why is that so important? And why have you committed to that? Yeah, I think part of it is the the root of communication is, is you have to repeat the same message often multiple times before it really sticks. Right. And that's kind of the same thing with behaviors is you you need people to think through a problem and kind of learn to approach it a different way. And that's not something that you can just solve, you know, at a specific point in time. It's something where you need to apply multiple situations where that that person that, that you're coaching can start to think differently. And, and really the the area that I applied it with you that was so critical was when we were trying to apply spin selling into our organization. And we really struggled with not, we didn't struggle with getting people to understand the, 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 the purpose of value-based selling and, and kind of the psychology of why buyers buy the way that they buy. But it's one thing to agree in the principles. It's another thing to really apply that in a different way of thinking and a different way of operating and a different way of communicating. And really the only thing you can, the only way to approach that is, is repetition and practice and helping people draw their own conclusions rather than you just instructing them in what to do is kind of the core principle, right? So I think that's the, 
yeah, it's basically behavioral change, right? Is 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 really what the root of coaching is, and and it, it's not something that you can just tell somebody what to do. It's something you need to get them to think and learn what works better, and by applying that in a way that's more effective, that will cement that behavior as the right thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned spin and and huff weight. We used to tell people, people like organizations and people don't change sudden. They just don't. It always takes time. So that's been a big source of frustration. And maybe for those listening, if you thought about, you know, we've had these big change initiatives or a new training approach, a new sales process or method, and it's been so frustrating to get people to pick it up and apply it and change the way they think. I think one of the things you could take away from what Greg is saying is maybe you haven't been doing it over a long enough period of time. You're expecting, you know, kind of fast turnaround. That's just not how behavior change works, does it? And there's, you know, there's certainly people that will say, you know, that change is not hard, that all it really takes is commitment and discipline and and thinking boldly and having bold goals and so forth. And to some extent, that's true in terms of, you know, driving your organization to operate differently. But there's, there's this psychological aspect of behavioral change that it's not, it's not just about wanting change and it's not just about saying this is how it needs to be and there's no magic light switch that goes off it's the area where change initiatives in my experience always fall over is when there's not that recurring discipline of coaching and and supportive reinforcement and kind of helping people to learn how to think differently we're not robots you can't just say no next time you're going to do it this way and then magically that happens it's just not it's just not the way people are wired right so i i think change uh it isn't in itself hard but the way that you approach it can certainly make it a lot harder than it needs to be because you're basically setting yourself up for failure if you're not leading in the right way Uh that lines up with my experience too, right? Being in the change business as many years, it's, it's I've seen this play out so many times. So let's, you've been a successful leader in the business development or sales function, the marketing function, and then in a more of like a general management capacity. So what do you, mo- what do you love most about leading a team? I think most people know what it feels like to work on a high performing team. Most people, when they experience that, they, they really enjoy it and it's kind of like a drug. You want you want that high performing team to always be there, right? And in my experience, I learned that leading that change in a team is kind of like feeding that feeding that drug. I really, I really like uh, having something take off where I'm not necessarily required to make it sustain. It's rewarding to be on a team that is high performing. It's even more rewarding to lead the team that's high performing because you feel that you're getting more out of your team. You're getting more performance from the collective. And the truth is, is ultimately that makes the leader look good because you get better performance. Everybody looks to your team and says, wow, your team's working really, really well. Right. And I feel like it's one of those everybody wins situations, right? The people on the team perform better, the leader performs better, the organization performs better. So to me, that's a lot more, it's more than just helping people, right? It's about performance. And then the other thing is, is, you know, I, I think any leader gets to a, 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 a period in their career where they're trying to delegate more. They're trying to you know, get stuff off of their plate so that they can do other things themselves, right? So that they can grow or be promoted or what have you. And and the only way you can effectively delegate is if you have a team that can do the job without you. Uh, and if you're constantly the crutch for them to get things done, uh, then that's not helping you to succeed either, right? So, you know, I, I find once you reach that point of a of a high performing team, you know, your as in, you know, the leader's stress goes down. You feel that you can, you know, focus on new initiatives. You're not just bogged down in the grind type of thing. And the reality is it, uh, it takes a time investment in order to get to that point. And then on the, on the sales side, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you're winning more deals, right? And there's, I've never met a salesperson that doesn't like winning more deals. And if you can help people to, to sell in a different way where they're closing more 
And, you know, whether it be at the sales department level or across a regional business unit or even a global sales team, uh, you know, raising the performance of a large group of people to generate something like more revenue or more sales where the, the metrics don't lie, everybody sees the increasing imp- increase in performance, you know, that looks good for everybody that looks good for the people selling it looks good for the people leading it looks good for the organization so it's just one of those things where it's it's good for everybody yeah you, know, you said something a few minutes ago i want to dig into and you were kind of talking about what it feels like to be part of a high performing team or a high performing culture i know you've hired new people into the business what if you you know what do you do if someone who's coming into the organization or maybe they're coming into a newer role what do you do if someone hasn't experienced what it's like to be part of a high performance culture? Like, how do you give them, the, do you give them a taste of it? Like, what's the, what's the approach there? Because I get it. I know how that can fuel more effort and kind of feed the motivation. I'm wondering, what if I don't bring that into the job? What if you're taking a chance on me? Or what if I'm new and, you, you know, I've just never really experienced what it's like to be in a high performing environment? What would you do about that? Yeah, I don't know if I could put really put my finger on it. I, I think, you know, you're getting into that area of of culture, right? And whether it's the culture of the team or the culture of the entire organization, it doesn't really matter. It's still a culture at some different scale. And when someone comes into a team that is performing well, the attitude of everybody that's on that team is different. The way that they talk about each other is different. I'm sure the way they talk about their leader is different and you respect the opinions of your peers right so i you know i don't know whether as a leader bringing someone in i would take the approach of you know showing them what um what the success of their peers is i would let their peers show them right because i think that's much more powerful and it's much more inspiring for that uh employee now you know obviously as a you know if you have your recurring uh, cadence with that new employee and you're you know helping them to draw conclusions and learn what works and what doesn't work yeah and you know as a leader you're going to expose them to good behaviors and and you know get some whether it be wins on the board or uh, some kind of positive reinforcement that causes them to sort of mesh into the culture right but I wouldn't be so direct to say yeah well hey we're a high performing team and here's why like cuz that to me is not inspiring right to me it's all in it's all in the culture it's in the attitude it's in the way that people talk and behave amongst each other and you you can see it when you when you're in a room with another team that is high performing you can see by the way they interact and by the way they support each other right and yeah i i, I can't i can't think of how i would do something specific to call someone's attention to that. I think I would just let it organically happen, right? Yeah, but I'm thinking about the teams you've led, and I think the reason, maybe the reason you haven't had to be so sort of direct or prescriptive about it with new joiners is that the people on your team knew what was expected of them in the first place, right? Right. That that the expectations for how the job is to be done, I think, are you know are pretty clear, and it's because of that. You've got an environment where you can trust that the behavior that those current team members demonstrate to that new joiner, right? That that it's going to it's going to encourage the right kind of behavior versus the wrong kind of behavior, right? So that's kind of the role the role of leader in that in that situation. Like, let's just make sure that they what do we want them to reflect? What do we want these new people to 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 see, right? When they're when they're having those conversations. Not with me, the leader, but when they're exposed to the others on the team. Okay. Driving great sales results is hard. Doing it consistently is even harder. There are so many obstacles that can prevent you from becoming the most effective sales leader you can be. Find practical advice you can apply right away by picking up your copy of Matt's book, The Divine Comedy of Sales, at www.divinecomedyofsales.com. Right, you were talking about you know, kind of bringing in a new person a little while ago and you know, kind of the chance that you take the bet that you make by investing in their development early versus sort of doing for them that it's really the better, the better path is to invest in development knowing that 
they're building some of their own capability that's going to that's going to pay off for you as a leader at some point but what have you found to be the most challenging part of leading and developing people uh, yeah i guess there's two perspectives for me one which is on the leader is is time right like you know it, it's most people are in crisis mode for a large part of their uh, a large part of their job until they figure out how to break the chain right and once you get caught in that death spiral, it's very tempting or, or easy to say, yeah, you know, I don't have time to sit down and actually explain and coach and, and you know, uh, try to build that culture, right? But the problem is, is that you're going after short-term time savings, but you're sacrificing some pretty significant long-term uh, time savings in doing so. So there's, there's, there's that is, is kind of seeing the seeing the uh the forest for the trees right i need to do this because if i if i'm disciplined then in the long run it will pay off and, and i can say that is absolutely true and you know this concept of you know one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions that they're sacred right that basically you have a, a a time frame that's allotted for an individual and you don't break that that's a commitment to that person it's a commitment to your long-term strategy and even I mean, barring like a, you know, a, a safety incident or something that's like truly, you know, got to drop everything. I, I, you know, I, or, or you're sick or, or, or something, but if there's a, a, a quote unquote work crisis, you know, accepting that it, it can wait, it can wait an hour because I have a scheduled meeting with that individual. Right. So the, really the commitment to time. Isn't that, yep. yeah, sorry to interrupt. Isn't that, that's part of, doesn't that go back to what you were talking about at the very top about a cadence or kind of a rhythm to, I right? see so you said a couple of things there. One was like, know what my priorities are. It's developing people. And I have to keep those moments as sacred. I can't sort of move them around or cancel. Right. But you said earlier, the ver one of the very first things you said that you learned was you got to have a sort of a cadence about how you do the work, right? So my writing, putting those two things together, it's the know what your priorities are, it's development, make sure that you've got a cadence or a rhythm in which that's happening. Is that, does that sort of work to overcome the time challenge that you're describing? Yeah. I mean, although, you know, if, if your listeners are probably saying, well, gee, that sounds like a lot of time and it is a lot of time. I mean, if you're meeting with each Per, say you have a team of five people and you're meeting with each of them for a 30 to, to 45 minutes minimum per week in a one-on-one -on -one session, that's a lot of time. Sure. And it may be tempting to say, I can spend that time on other things, but I can tell you that if you invest that time, say over a three to six month period, the return that that team will give you on that investment is an order of magnitude more in terms of their performance the uh you know the the things that they'll be able to do without you in the room right so you uh, that they're if, if their loyalty you know all of that the, the the fact that you're making time for somebody uh they really really value that investment in their own personal growth right so yeah there's a there's a recurring aspect to it and that it needs to happen you know certainly at least bi-weekly but preferably weekly again depending on the type of behavior change that you're trying to drive but then once that recurring rhythm is established, you don't move it or you, you, you make sure that you, that you ask yourself, should I really be moving this? Like, what's the, what, what are the trade-offs of me moving this? And you have to resist the temptation of saying, you know, oh, my boss is yelling for X, Y, Z. I need to, I need to bump these meetings with my team. Yes. You know, there will be cases where an emergency happens, but if you get in, in the, if you start looking at yourself and you, and you realize, well, you know, every other meeting I'm rescheduling or moving, that's a problem. And it shows that you're not changing your rhythm for your team. And, you know, I can, I can tell you, I, there was a case, uh, you know, a few years ago where I had a, a, you know, a weekly, I was setting up weekly rhythms with a manager and, you know, he came to me and said, yeah, there's this crisis going on. You know, I need to, I need to move our meeting or, you know, would you like to reallocate our time so that we can solve this particular problem? And I'd respond back to him. I said, no, this is our, this is our time. We need to do it. The other stuff can wait. You only have to do that once or twice for that employee to sit back and go, holy crap, my manager really cares about investing in me. Right. 
and that the the signal that you that you send that it matters to you you also create a really valuable precedent that that manager then applies to their direct reports as you, you know as you you know grow into a multi-level organization if you're at the top and you show that discipline and you show that commitment to you know your business leaders that report to you they will take all those good behaviors that they value and appreciate and then they they will apply it down down the line right and so it's again sort of leading by example and feeding that culture change which is really what you're trying to ac accomplish is you want this development culture you want everybody to care about developing each other and you want the way that people interact to be more supportive and more about you know coaching and and drawing the right conclusions rather than everybody's just crisis yelling barking orders at each other and just expecting it to get done right yeah the way you're describing this for those listening it's sort of like we make this not only do we commit to development and carve out the time for development conversations with our team, but that that's an investment. I'm going to listen back to this. I don't know how many, how many times you use, you use the word investment is probably six or seven times just in a few minutes when you're talking about the time and development conversation. And I think that's the right way of looking at it. And I know that's the way you've done it and the way we've talked about doing it for years, that it's an investment. But the way you just described it is it's not only an investment in the development of that person the one-to-one -one relationship, but when they, if they are a leader today or if they are a leader in the future, it's an investment that pays off dividends at multiple levels that you see paying off later, right? Absolutely, yeah. And the, re the return is significant on its own, even if you didn't have that downstream kind of recycling of benefit. But when you add in that, when you add in that you're, you're coaching to coach it's an absolute no-brainer and it's it's all about that culture change because once you set that in motion the performance of the whole organization goes up right everybody's attitude improves everybody they value each other more yeah so for me as a leader that's what i always focus on is not about immediate problem it's more about how do you cr create sustainable change so that that organization can perform better right mm -hmm. And I feel like coaching is a key uh -huh. attitude that everybody needs to have. Yeah. Not just an event, but an attitude. Love it. All right, Greg, we've only got another minute or two here. Believe it or not, time flies when you're talking about things you love, right? So I'm going to ask you a purposely big open-ended question I like to ask people. It's one that I've gone to. It's, I go to the well often with this one. What else, Greg? What else? What else do you think we need to know? about leading others, about selling, about anything we haven't talked about today that you think someone who's currently leading today or who aspires to lead sellers tomorrow, like what, are they, what else do they really need to know before we close? Yeah, I mean, this one might be, uh, might be a little bit negative, but I think it's important for people to realize is that coaching doesn't always work. And it's very tempting as the coach to see that as some kind of personal failure or you know that that you you couldn't unlock the potential that you saw in a in a in an employee that reported to you and certainly there's some balance there right you're you know you need to invest your own time and you need to try different approaches and you need to be patient because coaching is rooted in patience but eventually you will come to the conclusion that uh, somebody that you deal with is resistant to what needs to change, or they, you know, they say all the right things, but they don't actually put it into practice. And you do have to prepare yourself for that. I can tell you, it doesn't feel good when that happens. It feels like a, like a personal failure on the part of the leader. But at the end of the day, you have to realize that, you know, there's only so much time that you can invest in, in, in somebody. They have to put in the effort too. So having that sort of direct conversation with yourself about, you know, is it time for me to uh, spend my effort on someone else? You know, do I need to either remove this person from my team or do I need to, you know, leave them in their role, but accept that that's the most I'm ever going to get out of them. Right. And that's, uh, that's just reality. And I can't stress enough that you don't want to rush to a conclusion like that. You know, we're, we're talking about you know, depending on the circumstances, we're talking, you know, several months of trying to make it work right before you make that, that, that call. But you, you do need to realize that 
coaching doesn't always work, right? It, 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 you know, maybe your style is not right for that person. Maybe that person's not receptive for what you're trying to accomplish. You can have very frank conversations about what works and what doesn't work. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a two way street. You know, the, the, the coach and the coachee have to, have to want to, to, to get better together. And that attitude's got to be, and that commitment's got to be there. But on the flip side, you know, when you see it working, it's pretty amazing because you see that individual raising their performance. There is, I guess what I'm saying is there's some balance there. You need to be direct with yourself when it's not working and you need to be self-reflective. And sometimes that means admitting that what you're doing isn't working. And sometimes it's hard to do that. Right, right. right. Well, it's a good look. Coaching is a two-way street. It's sort of like buying and selling, right? There's somebody on the other end of this and either they're going to commit to do something differently or they're not. Success in selling, as you know, is, you know, did they, did the, did the buyer commit to take an action that moved this forward? Over time, if we're not seeing that person we're coaching, who's sort of the buyer in that transaction, we're not seeing them take action. It's sort of like calling that customer who, you know, just beating your head against the wall, right? They just never act. But I, I hear and respect what you said. Like you've got to, I think, know that you put in the effort to try to develop, know that you've given it the time and you've, and then and only then can you reasonably come to that point where you're like, wow, I don't, I really don't know if this person can be successful in this role or even has the potential to stretch beyond where they are right now. And it is a tough lesson. It's kind of a, it's a t- it's bitter, but the more you do it, the more important you realize it is that you be able to make that call and, and protect your time. Agreed. Yeah. And I mean, I think where it gets, where, where it's most difficult is when you're trying to coach people to coach, because in my experience, it's a lot easier to be coached than it is to coach. And a lot of times people that are being coached, they obviously, they know they, they're being coached and they respond positively and they say, this is great. This is working really well for me. And you get a lot of positive reinforcement. And then when you ask that mid-level sales leader to then go and apply the same principles to someone else, they've got to learn the patience and the cadence and all the skills that you learned. And you can help them with that through coaching. But at the end of the day, they've got to put it into practice and they've got to be committed to doing it. And they've got to be, they, they've got to embrace the philosophy. Yeah, this role is not for everybody, right? It's, it's, uh, we've seen a lot of people try and, and struggle. Well, look, Greg, we're at time. This has been great. I really appreciate you offering some of the lessons you've learned over the years leading. And what I'm going to do now when I let you go is I'm going to summarize a few of the key points, share them with the listeners and then challenge them to think about how this can be applied, some of the things you've shared with us, how they can apply them to their world immediately. So thanks so much for joining us. It's been great to have the conversation today. You're very welcome, Matt. Thanks. Always a pleasure uh, talking to you. Now, I want to thank Greg Lands for joining us. You know, Greg and I have worked together over the course of many years. He's a friend now um, after working together nearly a decade. And he said a few things today. It's interesting when you work closely with someone over, over the years, you think you know how they look at things. And then you have a conversation like I did with Greg today. And I'm like, oh, wow, okay, that was really interesting. I didn't know he was looking at, at the situation quite that way. So Greg said a few things that I think are really interesting. And if you put two or three of them together, I think they illustrate what is like the central challenge for people in sales leadership roles. So what did he say? One of the things he said was time is the greatest challenge. I hear that a lot. I don't have enough time to do important things well is a kind of a version of a complaint I hear from uh, many sales leaders. I've heard that over the years. Something else he said though, that I'll connect, thinking differently takes time. So you connect that up with something that he said early in the conversation, which was about a key lesson he's learned about leading. He said, creating a cadence is one of the most important things we can do as leaders. So let's put those three things together. Creating a cadence is one of the most important things. Why is that? Well, we have to make sure that we're getting to paying attention to and devoting time to the most important things. And we have to do that in a predictable sort of a way. We have to have a cadence or an operating rhythm that makes sure that we're covering important things regularly. What are some of the challenges 
that get in the way of that? Well, one, time. There's never enough of it. Time is the greatest challenge. It's our greatest asset. It's not our greatest enemy, but we have to think about having important conversations. And here's the connection with thinking differently takes time. We also have to reserve time for ourselves and for our teams to take some time to think differently. That might come in the form of planning. That might come in the form of brainstorming, whatever form it takes. So I think one of the really big takeaways from the conversation today with Greg is we know that time is a huge challenge, right? It's a super important asset. If we waste it, it never comes back. We also know that we've got to sort of wrangle time and, and create an operating rhythm or a cadence for our team or our whole organization or for ourselves that makes sure we spend time focused on important things. But we have to remember that one of those important things is thinking differently and helping other people think differently and helping other people make time to think differently. So I think that's a huge takeaway. So for those of you listening to today's episode, keep in mind the key message from Greg, that we've got to take action to make sure that we're reserving time to do the really important things well. And one of the things that takes time that ultimately can have massive impact on the degree to which you deliver value to your team, to your clients, to executive leadership, to everyone you come in contact with, is to make time to think differently. Well, that's something to ponder. I'm gonna let you chew on that as we close today's episode and prepare for the next episode of the Divine Comedy of Sales podcast. I'm gonna have another great guest, another great interview, and I really would love for you to join me for that next conversation. Until then, this is Matt McDarby, author and host of the Divine Comedy of Sales podcast. Thank you so much for joining me for today's episode. We'll see you soon.